Hello and welcome to RBCM at Home. My name is Kim Goff and I'm a learning program developer at the Royal BC Museum. I'm coming to you today from the Royal BC Museum, which is on the territory of the Lekwungen people in Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. I extend my appreciation for the opportunity to live and learn on this territory. And I encourage you all to consider the traditional territory on whose land you are on today, wherever you are joining us from. And we're so happy you're joining us. RBC at Home started one year ago when our museum and archive closed due to the pandemic. It was an opportunity to talk to staff about what they were working on from home. Now, even though the museum has reopened, we've continued this program as a way of staying connected with people at home or school around the province. And this program and previous ones have been recorded and you can find them on the Royal BC Museum's YouTube channel. Today's guest is Elizabeth Rolacek. Elizabeth grew up in Montreal and moved to Victoria four years ago to attend UVic, where she studies biology and earth sciences. In the spring of 2020, she started working on a project at the Royal BC Museum for course credit. And after a lot of COVID safety planning, she started in September of 2020. To tell us more about the project is Elizabeth and her supervisor, Dr. Victoria Arbor, curator of paleontology here at the Royal BC Museum. Welcome, Elizabeth. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm oh, really is, excited. Yeah, it was, I was so pleased when, um, when Victoria recommended we have a chat and find out more about this project. So um, Elizabeth, when did you first realize that paleobiology was an area you were interested in? Right, I uh, probably in my third year of university, which was last spring, actually, I was in a paleobiology class which was required and I didn't really know very much about paleobiology and then after that I reached out to Victoria and I kind of asked if we could meet up so I could learn a little bit more about the life of a paleobiologist in a museum and at that point we met up and then I started doing some volunteer work in her lab at the museum and then COVID kind of hit and I had been doing a lot of reading about paleobiology and it kind of meshed the two things that I was learning, which was biology and then earth and ocean sciences, which is my degree. So it kind of gave me that common area where I was able to, uh, to really connect the two degrees. And I think that's kind of how I got into paleobiology. And then Victoria offered to be an advisor for this project, which I got course credit for. And I guess the rest is history. <laughs> Uh, Victoria, maybe you could give, um, for the benefit of others, and, and maybe even me, a little more of a definition of what's the difference between a paleontologist and a paleobiologist? Oh, what a good question. Um, so there actually isn't a huge difference between those two words. Um, paleontology is sort of the older term, and it's still totally used, like I would call myself a paleontologist. Um, paleobiology is sort of a newer word that I think tries to capture some of the like um, the new ways of looking at fossils that have developed over the last few decades. So we're not just describing species and like, you know, sort of stamp collecting as people like to call it, but we're really trying to understand, um, you know, what these animals were like when they were alive, how they fit into their ecosystems and how they change through time. So it's just sort of a slight variant on the same general idea as a paleontologist. Okay, thank you. That helps. That helps a little bit. And I guess um, this was sort of an area that was new for you, uh, Elizabeth, as well. You were saying you're not someone who is dinosaur crazy necessarily, or were you? No, I actually, I never really went through like that dinosaur phase that everyone else went through as a kid. So it wasn't something that was on my radar when I was starting my degree at UVic. Um, and it's just something that I kind of fell into and yeah, I don't know. It's definitely a different form of science from what I'm used to. And I've just been really enjoying the project that I've been working on. Excellent. Well, Elizabeth, we'll have you tell us more about that project. I believe you have some slides to help illustrate mm -hmm. what you've been working on. So please uh, yeah, go for ahead sure. and share. And during your presentation, yeah. if people have questions, feel free to use the chat or the Q&A and I'll keep my eye on that. And I will jump in if there's something that um, we need to address while you're going. Otherwise we'll have time at the end as well. Perfect, let me get this screen share going. There, I see that, looks great. Perfect, okay. 
I'm just gonna minimize my face here so I don't keep looking at me. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Okay. Well, hello again. My name is Elizabeth Rolchek, and I'm in my final semester of my Bachelor of Science at the University of Victoria. I'm completing a combined degree in biology and earth and ocean sciences. And I really moved from Montreal to Victoria so that I could study something along the lines of marine sciences, maybe become a marine biologist. And I fell into this, which is a completely different realm of marine sciences that I never really knew about until now. And I'm really excited to share some of the research I've been doing over the past six months about whale fossils found here on Vancouver Island. Right now, I am based in Victoria, BC. I've been learning at UVic and at the Royal BC Museum, which are on the traditional territory of the Lukungun peoples and the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasanish peoples whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. I'm gonna start off with the specimens that I have there on the screen. On the left side is a scapula. So the scapula is part of the shoulder. It's from a whale from the Oligocene time period, which I will get into. And on the right there are two backbones, so two vertebrae still encased in the rock that they were found in. Perfect. So we can start with what is a whale. So whales are in the larger group, the larger group of cetaceans. And today we know whales as the ones that we see swimming around. So if you're here near the Salish Sea, you've probably seen this guy here. This is the orca whale. Um, we've got the orca whales, the resident and the transient orcas that swim around here in the Salish Sea. A distinguishing feature of the orca is the fact that they have teeth. So they're a toothed whale and that means that they hunt their prey. So they hunt seals, they hunt fish, and they don't have a tendency to grow as large as we see some other whales to be. But these guys are still pretty significant in size. But again, not as large as some of the gigantic whales, such as the humpback whale. So this is a humpback whale, and typically these whales to uh, grow to be over 12 meters long, uh, and they weigh immense amounts. They are actually just gigantic. A distinguishing feature of this whale is actually the way that they feed. So they have baleen plates that hang in their mouth and allow them to be filter feeders. So they don't have teeth. All they have is this baleen. And the baleen allows them to take in vast amounts of water. They take these huge sips and then they can filter through that water, catching really small prey that they feed on and that sustains their huge body size. There's other aspects that are different between baleen and toothed whales. And some of the things that I've been really interested in in my research is the evolution to kind of the divergence of these two species and where they evolved from, which is this guy here. So this is actually what is thought to be the first form of a whale. This is Pachycetus, and Pachycetus is an amphibian-like whale that roamed what we know to be today as modern-day Pakistan. Um, he, Pachycetus was around about 56 million years ago. As you can see, Pachycetus uh, was a land-dwelling creature that did swim around in fresh water. But the question is, how did we get from this, from Pachycetus, to where we are today? Over the past 56 million years, whales have been evolving. They've been losing body parts such as legs, and they've been developing new strategies for their lives in the ocean. My research focuses on fossils found in the Oligocene time period. So the Oligocene time period is actually a geological time period that started about 33.9 million years ago and lasted around 10 million years. The reason I have it highlighted here is because it was a crucial time in the evolution of whales. During the Oligocene, the true splitting of toothed whales from baleen whales started to happen. Before the Oligocene, whales had teeth and they were hunting their prey. And suddenly there was this shift in their mouth and some whales started to develop baleen plates that hung in their mouth. Um, this made them filter feeders. And there's a lot of different hypotheses for 
how the baleen started, why it started. And I think that's something that really makes paleobiology quite interesting is nobody knows for sure. Nobody was there to watch whales develop baleen and such. So around the same time as baleen was developing, there were other things that were changing amongst whales. For example, echo, for example, echolocation, which is something that toothed whales still possess to this day. And we'll get into that a little bit later. The first question though is really why baleen? So baleen is made up of keratinous plates, which are similar to other keratinous structures such as hooves or hair or nails. So baleen occupies roughly the same position as teeth would in most other mammals. They would hang from the top of their jaw in these sheet-like plates. The evolution of baleen allowed whales to target vast amounts of water and then target vast amounts of small prey, such as krill there that you see in the bottom right. By targeting krill and species at the lower end of a food web, whales were able to basically colonize a whole other prey. They were able to diverge from just eating seals and fish and such. And then this way, they were kind of getting closer to the nutrition source. So they'd taken these big sips of water and they were able to filter out all of the krill. And by taking in so much of these small planktonous um, animals, it really supports their gigantic body size. One of the things with baleen is that it's not actually often fossilized, but what we can do is we can assess a whale's jaw bones and see where there would be evidence for where, for where baleen once, once hung in their mouths. The other thing that was, one of the other things that was developing during this time, during the Oligocene time period was echolocation. Echolocation, which is also known as bisonar, is quite frankly, the ability to see with the use of sound. So it's often used by animals in dark locations, such as muddy or turbid waters, maybe the deep ocean. And what they do is they use these vibrational noises and they send them out into their environment and listen for the echoes. And once it bounces off something like prey or the ground or rocks, it gets sent back to them. Echolocation is actually clicks that are generated in their nasal appar apparatus and then pressurized air is forced past two phonic lips, causing them to slap against each other in the process. And when these clicks hit an object, they're reflected and returned to a mandibular fat pad on the whale. So this is for toothed whales, such as the orca that I showed earlier, but living baleen whales, such as humpbacks, lack all facial structures needed for echolocation. So what, actually something that they get confused for is the whale songs. So whale songs versus echolocation. And whale songs are actually quite interesting. And what they are is just a very low frequency song that large baleen whales sing in order to communicate for courting. And there's even evidence that maybe they're just using them to fill the silence of the deep ocean. <laughs> All right, so the way that I am using fossils is to study whale evolution. So there's only a few regions in the whole world where whale fossils from the Oligocene can be found. And we're lucky enough that the North Pacific is one of them and even luckier because on Vancouver Island, we have whale fossils from the Oligocene. The fossils I'm working on come from Meyer Creek Beach, which you can see labeled on the map here with a red star. And some of the fossils are also from Kirby Creek, which is just nearby. The fossils I work with weren't collected by me, but by collectors who bring in their findings to the museum. So collectors such as Steve Suntock, Raymond Graham, T.E. Cross and Crispin Guppy make it possible for me to do this research. And that's actually an important thing that we touched on earlier, Kim, is the importance of museums and fossils is the sharing of fossils. So when someone finds a fossil and they bring it to the museum, they're able to contribute to scientific findings and it allows researchers to then add that to their collection and further their knowledge of evolution. And in our case, uh, whale evolution. So we can date these fossils. And when I say date, we can figure out the age of the fossils 
based on the rock that they are found in. So a fossil found in a cliff face can be aged based on how old that piece of the cliff face is. For example, the fossils that I'm working with were found primarily in the Souk Formation. And the Souk Formation is part of the Carmana group which through geological dating and mapping and radiometric analysis, we've been able to figure out that the Souk formation is from the Oligocene time period, which makes these fossils quite interesting when it comes to the evolution of whales. Something important to note is that the specimens I'm working with have been collected by several different people over 40 years. So the fossils weren't all found at once kind of articulated or connected to one another, indicating one specific whale. So here you can see a bone bed where a whale has been still in its shape. The fossils I'm working with are potentially from several different individuals, maybe not all the same species of whale. So it makes it a little bit more complicated, but also it gives me a bunch of different pieces to a bunch of different puzzles. So we'll get into how I, the process through which I evaluate fossils. So when looking at fossils, there are a few different methods that we use. We can evaluate their structure, features, and hopefully we can narrow down what individual they belong to or part of what group. On the left there um, is a picture of me that's been circulating around quite a bit for this, uh, for this talk. And it's me at the Royal BC Museum, and I am evaluating some of the backbones that we have in the collection, some of the cetacean backbones. So when I evaluate a specimen, I typically make a rough sketch of them. I take a bunch of measurements. I keep track of any distinguishing features or breakages that might be there. And um, from there, I can kind of write up a physical description of what I see and what I find to be important from this fossil. On the top right, I have one of the one of the vertebrae that I'm working with is an atlas vertebrae. So the atlas is the first one in your spinal column, and it's pressed up right against the back of your skull. And then on the bottom right there is a rib specimen. Um, the one thing that I learned, one of the major things, is that ribs are not always diagnostic of a specific animal or a specific individual. So it's possibly a whale rib. It could also be from a seal or sea lion of some sort. So it's all these different uh, factors that really play into the assessment of fossils. Once I've taken measurements and I, I then take photos of the fossils. So I take a lot, a lot of photos and this can sometimes be quite tedious because I try to get good angles and the lighting just right. And I try to get quite a few views of each specimen. The photos are important because they are what I can share with the scientific community. Because it isn't always possible to go to every museum in the world that might have a specimen of interest to you, you can evaluate based on photos that have been published and descriptions that have been published in scientific journals, which is a huge aspect of paleontology, which I learned pretty quick, is uh, reading through a lot of published journals to assess pictures and compare with what you have. And then sometimes you're presented with specimens that are funky looking or broken, so on the left there is a specimen that Victoria and I looked at for quite a while um, and we realized that it's actually two different specimens that were potentially attached at some point and we weren't quite sure what they belonged to, maybe a piece of a snout. So it's not always that a specimen is perfect when you find it. Um, on the right there is a really funny shaped piece that is even possibly a part of a a skull of a, uh, a whale. Elizabeth, if uh, before you leave that picture, if you want to go back just one second. Oh, yeah. If you use your, your mouse or your cursor, you can show us um, those parts in particular. So you said there were two fossils we're looking at there. I'm assuming that's yeah. the, where we see the two numbers written on. Right, exactly. Okay. And here, can you see my mouse? Yes, yeah. So those okay, are two, perfect. Yeah, so you can see 
Yeah, they're two different fossils. They're actually labeled as two separate specimens because they're not attached. And um, so, yeah, they are two different fossils there on the left and then broken at some point. And then on the right side is um, the same the same fossil, but different views. Um, and the piece you said that might be part of a skull, which one is that? Or where do you see that? That's the one here on the right. So on the top right and oh, bottom right you. is the same one. Yeah, and just, uh, yeah, so just different views, but it just goes to show that the shape is always different depending on what you're looking at. So that's definitely mm -hmm. been something when it comes to photo taking that you have to be aware of. It's critical, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> no problem. Um, I wanted to share what this project looked like during COVID. So Victoria, Dr. Arbor had first approached me about this project offer in the spring of 2020. So it was right as COVID was starting to ramp up and we were all thinking, oh, it's okay by May of 2020, we're all gonna be fine. This is just a little thing. And then summer of 2020 came and went and then we were getting ready for our project to start in September and we realized, okay, COVID is here for a while. What, how are we gonna adjust so that we can still do the fossil assessment? So what we did, these photos are actually from the fall of 2020 when I had first started. So this was September, October of, uh, of 2020. And what we were doing was we were meeting in the evenings at the museum. So on Wednesday nights, uh, we would meet and we would bring out folding tables into the exhibit of uh, the Royal BC Museum. On the left there, you can see the mammoth in the background part of the BC Ice Age exhibit. And so we would sit there next to the mammoth and all of the Ice Age birds, and we would pop out our folding tables and assess fossils, do all of our work. And we did that for a few weeks. And then we transitioned to just doing kind of Zoom meetings every week. Luckily in January of 2021, uh, we were able to set ourselves up in a learning room at the Royal BC Museum. So that allowed us to have permanent tables. It allowed us to store fossils in a specific area and it definitely made our lives a little bit easier. But uh, yeah, it was definitely a, a shift in learning when it came to COVID. I think it's important to also touch on what the ocean environments around Vancouver Island were looking like around this time. So other than whales, who else was living in our corner of the world at the time? There is evidence for Desmos Stylins um, in the North Pacific from the end of the Oligocene period. These animals were fully herbivorous, eating plants in the near shore environments of the ocean. Desmos Stylins um, have gone extinct and they have no living relatives. So their lineage completely ended with them, which makes it difficult to study any animal that's gone extinct and doesn't have a living relative because you don't have something to compare it to anatomically, environmentally. Um, so here actually um, is a Desmos Stylin that was found on Sombrio Beach on Vancouver Island um, and was published on by uh, Brian Lee Beatty and Thomas Cockburn. This is Behemotops uh, Proteus there. And actually an earlier Desmos Island that was found on Vancouver Island was Cornwallia sucensis. So these animals were wandering around Vancouver Island around the same time as the whales were swimming in the ocean that I've been investigating. The reason I find it important to shed light on what else was living amongst whales at this time is you might ask, okay, but how do you know the fossils you're looking at belong to whales and don't belong to this funny looking hippo guy? Um, so the major way I've narrowed down who these fossils belong to is going through the process of elimination. Through the process of elimination, um, I've been able to basically figure out that the fossils I'm looking at belong to whales based on bone density. So the bone density of a Desmostylon is quite large. They are quite beefy guys. They have to be able to walk along the bottom of the water and eat plants in the nearshore environment. So they really depend on sinking. 
versus whales, as you probably think, don't really depend on sinking. They need to be more hydrodynamic. Their buoyancy is a big thing. So they have to be able to go up and down quite easily. The fossils I'm looking at have quite a smaller bone density than the Desmos Island remains that we have at the Royal BC Museum, which makes it great to be able to compare the two. I also wanted to show this because this is Vasilosaurus and I wanted to prove that the ocean was a very scary place at the time. I feel like whenever I try and make that joke, people don't realize that there were some really scary looking whales swimming around um, in the oceans around this time period. As you can see here, Basilosaurus had some pretty insane looking teeth. And it just goes to show how competition can really affect evolution. So having to compete with this whale here to find food might be difficult, which could have triggered some whales to find a new method of feeding. And it's really one huge part of evolution is the competition within your environment. Something I've learned through this project is how a fossil can really be a piece of a puzzle. And you're not quite sure what piece of the puzzle belongs to, but you put it down where you think it fits best. And hopefully someone else will come along and have that one piece you've been missing and put it down in the puzzle. And sometimes someone might come along and see your puzzle piece and say, oh, I think it actually belongs over there um, in a completely different puzzle. And I think that's been a learning curve for me in understanding how paleobiology is a lot of piecing things together and working within the community. Um, it's something that I wasn't really used to, this uncertainty within science. Here I have um, an, an image of an ancient river dolphin. And I actually learned about river dolphins through this project because I didn't actually know that these things still existed. In the bottom right there, you can see a living river dolphin. Um, I think that this one is from the Amazon. So a river dolphin is actually just a toothed whale who decided to colonize fresh water. And this was potentially beginning to happen in the Oligocene time period. River dolphins are still around today, as you can see in the bottom right there. Uh, they live in the Amazon and in some freshwater rivers in Asia. They diverge from the whales by colonizing freshwater and adapting to life in muddy freshwater. The reason I have this dolphin pictured is because the atlas bone that I've been mentioning is, um, it has evidence to compare it to ancient, ancient river dolphins, um, specifically possibly Squalodelphidae, which is part of this larger group called Plat Plat Platanistoidea. Um, their first step into freshwater environments isn't definitely known, but there are hypotheses for um, thinking that they were starting to colonize these freshwater environments as early as the end of the Oligocene, so around 23 million years ago. But it was just quite interesting to be able to kind of put a face to a potential owner of this bone that I've been working with. Um, this whale here is uh, Adiocetidae, which is a family of whales from the Oligocene. The key feature that these whales had was that they were baleen bearing whales. So they had the baleen plates, but they still had teeth. This really goes to show that you don't, evolution doesn't happen really quickly, right? It's you develop the baleen, you still have teeth. The whales didn't wake up the next morning and think, huh, I've got baleen, let's get rid of these teeth. It happened over millions of years. So there's some local species of Adiocetids here um, on Vancouver Island. For example, Chonocetus sucensis. And Chonocetus was found here on Vancouver Island in the 60s, actually. And since then, um, Adiocetids have been found all over the place. For example, Japan, Oregon, just to name a few. And in this picture, I've put two vertebrae on the left there and that funny piece that we were talking about on the top right. So the vertebrae there, I've um, kind of tried to conclude that they're from an adiocetid based on their size. So a lot of it is size comparison with other specimens that have been published on. 
the piece on the top right is a possible piece of a skull, uh, like I mentioned earlier, and actually possibly belonging to a species such as Chonocetus himself. And so there's a lot of specimens that I have been working with and there's still a lot that I'm trying to figure out. For example, one of the specimens is this scapula here. And from what I've been learning and reading, I do think that this is potentially from a baleen whale. I believe that it would probably belong to one of the first fully baleen feeding whales. But again, there's a lot of puzzle pieces and a lot of different puzzles needing pieces. So again, the whole learning curve thing. But um, again, comparing with recent literature and such has really allowed me to kind of dive into the different types of whales that were swimming around at this time. And the big question is always, but why is this important? So why is looking at these fossils and studying them so vital? The Oligocene was full of changes that whales were undergoing. There was the start of baleen feeding, echolocation, uh, just to name a few. So these adaptations were prominent in whale lineages and they're features that we still see today. Oligocene aged whale fossils are not very common and BC is the only place in Canada that we actually have Oligocene aged whale fossils. But not to mention how diverse the oceans were. We had all sorts of marine mammals swimming around. You had your Desmostylans, the funny looking hippos. You had whales swimming around. This was all happening in our little corner of the world. So analyzing fossils can help us um, complete puzzles and they can also assess what diversity was like at the time and maybe what kind of competition there were between whale species that could have caused such immense diversification amongst whales. Studying these fossils can also give us a new perspective on whales that we have in today's oceans and it allows us to analyze how changes to their environment might affect their own body. So for example, why was baleen an adaptation that whales took on? Was it because of high amounts of competition and they decided, okay, we need to find something new to eat. How do we eat these tiny little krill sized animals? Or was it, did it have something to do with the environment that they were in? Does it have to do with, yeah, so the competition, the environment, it could even have to do with ocean temperatures and such. These are questions we try to answer in order to apply them to what we know today. So for example, the big question that we're always asking, especially here in the Salish Sea is how will whales be affected by climate change? And are some of these, is some of the damage irreversible? Will they be able to cope? So maybe if we can use what we saw millions of years ago in terms of ch changes to their environment and how they adapted, maybe we can compare that to today. And as a closing, I just wanted to give a nice overview of what a whale's family tree would look like. So on the far right is our modern day whales there. Um, and then on the far left, you can see the hippopotamus. So you're kind of thinking, what do these guys have to do with each other? But whales are actually most, uh, most closely related to even toad ungulates. So any sort of hoofed animals except for horses. So the even-toed ungulates such as pigs, hippos, llamas, these are the whales kind of uh, on land relatives. A typical way of investigating any kind of animal is by looking at a phylogenetic tree, which is what I've got here. So on the far left, you've got the hippo. And as you move on that branch, you get to kind of a separation. And when you move to the left, you get to see where they kind of stopped evolving. There was a species. And as you move right at each kind of intersection of that tree, you uh, get to see how they evolved further and further and become what we see today. So I just want to thank you all for joining me and a big thank you to Dr. Victoria Arbor and the Royal BC Museum for providing me with such an amazing learning opportunity and learning environment. And um, I believe we'll have a little question period, but if we don't get around to everyone's questions, I really 
don't mind if you want to shoot me an email there. I put my email address up with it, which is just my first name at my last name dot com. And uh, yeah, so that's it for my presentation. Thank you, Elizabeth. We'll get you to stop sharing the screen. We have some yeah, for sure. very, very careful listeners here. Uh, and Lori is wondering, um, how do you tell the density of a bone? You were mentioning you were with the vertebrae and you were thinking, well, is it desmostylin? Is it a whale fossil? And you mentioned you looked at the bone density. How mm -hmm. do you measure bone density? Right. So that's when having um, specimens on site really helps. So because Victoria brought some desmostylin specimens to our learning room, I was able to compare what a desmostylin fossil looks like versus a whale fossil. So to assess bone density, sometimes you would go through like a microscopic type analysis and check out what the inner workings of a bone looks like. Uh, for me, I really compared visually and there was a very distinct um, difference between a desmostylin bone and how heavy it was versus a whale fossil. I mean, still some of those whale fossils you had to lift with your legs, but the desmostylin ones were definitely qu quite chunky. And that was really what I based it on was visually seeing these two specimens next to each other. Fantastic. And we are mm -hmm. talking, just for clarification, we're talking, the fossils you were looking at, I think you mentioned that they were the uh, around the 30 to 20 million years old. Is that the right time? Yeah, then? about, yeah, around there. Yeah, so like 33 to 23 million years, o uh, years old. Excellent. Well, it, you really have illustrated for me how this is such a puzzle. I was thinking, you know, you're, you mentioned it's like trying to find one puzzle piece, but imagine you have um, four or five different puzzles. They've all just been dumped out on the table and the pictures have all been thrown away. <laughs> so you have no <laughs> references and you have thousands and thousands of pieces and probably missing pieces too. And you're just, oh, trying, definitely. You're just trying to start to get a picture. And it's, it's really great to try to get a picture of what this place was like um, 25 oh, yeah. years ago. Um, Allie is asked, Allie who's watching today, oh, and her last name looks like yours. Allie is asking, um, what is the most interesting thing you've come, come across in your own fossil hunting in Victoria? Wow, some of the really interesting stuff. So, um, I don't know where to start. I think actually going to the location where the fossils I'm working on were found. So as I stated before, the fossils were brought in by collectors and I made a trip out to Meyer Creek, which is out in Shirley, BC. Um, I did a trip out there uh, um, actually with my roommate and we went and we walked around. And I think one of the most interesting findings that I've seen is actually sometimes the shell layers um, in the rocks. So a lot of the times uh, things like clams and mussels and snails, they get trapped in rock as well. And there's an entire other realm of paleobiology that investigates shelled organisms. So I think that's actually one of the really cool things. I myself haven't found, you know, a whale skull. It's probably a life goal of mine, but um, I would definitely say that seeing fossils that are just always going to be there in the rock is something that uh, is something that I would say is really cool. When, once you've seen that they're there, the next time you visit a beach like that, you now you know they're there and so you start oh, yeah. to see them. But before that, they just look like white speckles in a black stone. Exactly. Yeah, it's really great to have your eyes mm -hmm. open to that. Well, thank you so much for uh, sharing your presentation today and all that you've been mm -hmm. learning. My final question for you is what's been the best part about this project and what's been the worst part about the project? <laughs> um, we'll start with the best part. I think the best part has really been learning something new. So I had never really learned very much about paleobiology until of course I took this class through the university or, um, and then I kind of connected with Dr. Arbor. I think just learning an entire new part of science and kind of getting hooked on it has been the best part. It's just, I've kind of opened Pandora's box and I, I can't go back now. I think it's uh, something that I'm super interested in and would like to pursue further. So kind of finding that passion 
is probably the best part. Um, the worst part, I don't know if there's really a worst part. I don't know if there's something I would say went badly during this project, even if it, if it's difficult identifying some specimens, I wouldn't say that that was necessarily a bad aspect because I've learned so much through it. And even um, Victoria has been great in helping me when I'm writing my manuscript about like, how do we describe it and explain that we're not quite sure, but we describe it enough that someone can still use this information. Um, but I think, I guess COVID, if anything, has maybe put a little bit of a struggle on this project, but we've worked through it. And uh, I think it's just been a huge learning experience that I wouldn't have gotten otherwise. Great, Victoria, same question to you. Best part of having the project? Yeah, so I've really enjoyed working with Elizabeth on this because my, I'm not a whale, a whaleontologist as my <laughs> whale paleontologist friends like to call themselves. Um, I mostly work on dinosaurs. And so it's been really interesting for me to learn about whales and how we identify them. I've been sort of learning right alongside Elizabeth on these things. We've gotten to talk to some of our colleagues um, and ask them for advice, which is always fun. Um, yeah, and it's really great to be able to work on some local fossils. Most of the dinosaur fossils come from very far away from here in British Columbia. So they're still really cool. They're British Columbian, but, you know, it's a big job to go find them. Uh, whereas these fossils come from basically about an hour away from the museum, which is really cool. Uh, so, yeah, so, I mean, it's always fun to sort of dig into something new, work with bright, young, keen people who are willing to take on new challenges. Um, and I would say the worst thing, yeah, is just trying to navigate um, social distancing at the museum during a pandemic when we can't <laughs> access our usual spaces uh, and have to take lots of precautions. But I think everyone's done a really good job um, going with the flow on those things. And I'm very excited for vaccinations and when we can just go back to sort of our normal way of doing things eventually. So, yeah. Here, here. Let's all hope for uh, for, for that as well. Well, thank you again both so much. If you joined us late or you missed something and you want to go back, this has been recorded and you will find it on the Royal BC Museum's YouTube channel in the near future. So please have a look there. The museum has reopened and we are ready to welcome you back and you can find out more on our website about time tickets and exhibits. We will be continuing at home, at home kids and at outside for the foreseeable future and more information for, on that on the website as well. Next week, I'm going to be going virtually to Golden British Columbia, and I'll be joined there by museum manager Brittany Newman, who will give us a tour of the Golden Museum. So I hope you can join us then. Until then, take care of yourselves and one another, and thank you for participating. Bye-bye. <laughs>